Welcome to CIS 579. This is Chapter 5, Innovative E-Commerce Systems, from e-government to e-learning, collaborative commerce, and C2C commerce. The objectives for this chapter are to be able to discuss what e-government is and to describe some of the various e-government initiatives. We'll talk about some, e some of the e-government activities and implementation issues, including e-government 2.0 and m-government, or mobile government. We'll talk about e-learning, virtual universities, and e-training. We'll talk about e-books and their readers. We'll talk about knowledge management and dissemination in an e-business. In other words, how a business shares knowledge or holds on to knowledge over time. We'll describe and, descri and describe and discuss online advisory systems. We'll talk about collaborative e-commerce. We'll describe collaborative 2.0 or collaboration 2.0. And then we'll finish up talking about C2C activities in e-commerce. So what is e-government? E-government is, e is an e-commerce model in which a government entity buys or provides goods, services, or information to businesses or individual citizens. This is the approach the book has taken. Uh, perhaps a little bit more intuitively or a little easier to th way to think about it is that e-government is really the application of various e-commerce uh, tools and technologies and techniques to be able to provide services to citizens, to be able to uh, take advantage of some of the economies of scale, so to speak, that uh, e-technologies provide. Perhaps a specific implementation or specific uh, example of e-government put to use is government to citizens, G to C, an e-government category um, within e-government that includes all the interactions between government and its citizens and provides things like electronic voting, electronic benefits transfer. Uh, in many cases you can log in and play, uh, pay traffic fines, you can pay your utility bills, uh, you can, can vote on various issues and things like that. Another subcategory of e-government is G to B, government to business. An e-government category that includes interactions between governments and businesses government selling to businesses and providing them with services and businesses selling uh, products and services to the government. And basically there's a lot of interaction that goes on between government and, and businesses. Government needs supplies much like uh, businesses do. They need paper clips and, and cleaning supplies and, and raw materials and, and a lot of different things like that. Um, and in other cases they're providing services. They're providing uh, services to businesses in some cases. So there's those, that opportunity to be able to take advantage of e-commerce technologies to be able to streamline some of those interactions. Still other examples of e-government include government to government or G to G, an e-government category that includes activities within government units and those between governments. So for example, you may have the U.S. government that, that uh, conducts transactions selling military equipment or something of that nature to a foreign government. Internally, you may have different departments within the U.S. government that are, are uh, conducting trades, conducting transactions between themselves, or different levels of government. So say, for example, you might have a, a local municipality and a state uh, uh, government that exchange land uh, for some reason. Government to employees is another category, GTE, an e-government category that includes activities and services between government units and their employees. So it, it, much like you might have in, a, in an organization that uses uh, e-commerce e technologies to be able to allow their customers, or excuse me, allow their employees to log in and check their various benefits, their pay, uh, payroll benefits, things of that nature, you might do the same thing in the government setting, uh, allowing those government employees to log in, check their benefits, check their, their any other types of information that they, they might have on file with their, their employer, in this case, the government. Certainly this leads to certainly uh, certain levels of efficiency and, and effectiveness and that's really kind of the whole idea of applying these e-commerce technologies in these other settings. Like most organizations, government entities usually want to dive into the digital, er uh, digital era and provide as many services in the online environment and uh, using e-commerce technologies as they can. Unfortunately, this transformation to an e-government isn't as easily done as, as, as you might think. Um, these large organizations have to spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort to be able to move these services online. This is where Government 2.0 comes in. Basically, 
um, the, the government has really struggled to be able to provide those services and the promise of government 2.0 and various other social um, social networks really provide a lot of promise for government to be able to meet users halfway to be able to provide these services to users in a way that they they're capable of taking advantage of those services so the promise of, of government 2.0 includes things like improving the quality and, and responsiveness of services like education, health, and environmental management, to cultivate and harness the enthusiasm of citizens, letting them more fully contribute to their well-being and that of their community, to make democracy more participatory and informed, to unlock the immense economic and social value of information and other content held by governments to serve as a pre-competitive platform for innovation. Hopefully it can revitalize the public sector and make government policies and services more responsive to people's needs and concerns by providing government with the tools for a much greater level of community engagement. It should be able to allow the users of government services much greater participation in their design and continual improvement in these, in these services. It should involve communities of interest and, and practice outside the public sector which offer unique access to expertise, local knowledge, perspectives in policy making and delivery. And lastly, it should more successfully attract and retain bright, enthusiastic citizens to public service workforce by making them work less hierarchically and more collaboratively and more intrinsically rewarding. And the last classification of e-government covered in the text is mobile government or m-government. It's the wireless implementation of e-government, mostly to citizens, but also to businesses. Um, there's lots of benefits, obviously, to, to mobile government. This includes things like remote access, um, reduced costs, increased efficiency, um, added convenience and flexibility, better services to citizens, the ability to reach a larger number of people through mobile devices uh, than it would be than would be possible with just wired connections. So there's a lot of benefits to mobile government. Obviously, though, there's some, some implementation issues. Uh, wireless and mobile networks and related inf infrastructure have to be able to support that increasing demand. Um, to increase citizen participation and provide citizen-oriented services, governments need to offer easy-to-access mobile government information in several different forms. Mobile phone numbers and mobile devices are relatively easy to hack, and wireless networks are vulnerable because they use public airways to send signals, so all the traditional things that we see in, in wireless networks. Many countries have, have not yet adopted legislation for data and information practices that spell out the rights in, of citizens and the responsibilities of, of data holders. Um, so there, there are certainly some implementation issues. As far as applications, um, several wireless applications suitable for e-government are presented in the next chapter, so we'll talk about those a little bit more. But there's uh, B2E applications, especially for field employees, uh, B2C information discovery, such as the U.S. Government 511 National Parks and Travel System, um, as well as several other examples that, that are out there. Uh, but mobile commerce, mobile government, is here to stay. We're going to see this more and more. Section 5.2 talks about e-learning, e-training, and e-books. And e-learning is a, 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 an e-government application or, or um, program, if you will, that basically provides online delivery of information for purposes of education, training, or, or knowledge management. Um, obviously, there's benefits and drawbacks to e-learning relative to the tr traditional modes of, of learning. Some of the benefits include learning uh, learning and training time reduction. In other words, e-learning can reduce the training time by you know quite a bit, quite about a, quite a bit of time. Um, the book talks about uh, approximately up to 50 percent. Large number and diversity of learners, so we can reach a lot of uh, a lot of learners that we couldn't potentially reach before. Innovative teaching, the ability to provide innovative methods such as special engagement, interaction with experts, interaction with learners in other countries, etc. In other words, we can reach people that we haven't been able to reach before, not just in terms of students, but in terms of the content that we're providing. The measurement and assessment progress uh, in, in an online environment, it gives us the ability to assess programs in real time, find areas of difficulties, and design remedial work. 
So for example, on Blackboard, we can give a quiz and you can get immediate feedback about what your score was, what the correct answers were. And a lot of times this helps to benefit students because while it's fresh in their mind, they understand what they missed. Uh, there's cost reductions, there's higher content retention uh, due to self-paced learning. There's a richness and quality in the online environment that's more difficult to capture in the in the in the face-to-face -face environment uh, in terms of providing videos and links and uh, related articles and, and things of that nature. Flexibility and, and being self-paced, updated and consistent material, the ability to learn from mobile devices, expert knowledge, and then finally fear uh, a fear-free environment. Online environment a lot of times we don't have to worry about um, being intimidated by other other participants in the classroom that we might have in a face-to-face -face environment. But like most things in life, there are drawbacks, uh, and there certainly are drawbacks to, to e-learning. Uh, some of those drawbacks include things like the need for instructor retraining. Um, believe it or not, not a lot of professors like teaching in the online environment. They struggle with some of the online tools, such as uh, LMSs, learning management systems, like Blackboard. Um, other things like YouTube and uh, some of the various tools that, that are frequently used. Uh, equipment needs and support services. It costs money to be able to provide these services online. There's a lack of face-to-face -face interaction in campus life that some students uh, miss. They, they really could use that face-to-face -face interaction. Assessment and examinations are different. Uh, it's, it's hard to really make sure that the person taking the exam is really the person that should be taking the exam. Uh, maintenance and updating the, the e-learning materials. Protection of intellectual property. Once you put it out there, it's kind of available for everybody, isn't it? Students have to be somewhat computer literate as well, not just the instructors. And student retention. Without some human feedback, it may be difficult to keep some students mentally engaged and enthusiastic about e-learning over a long period of time. In other words, if you're not having to come to class and be engaged in class, then it's a little bit easier to lose you as a student. Table 5.3 uh, gives you uh, kind of a graphical illustration of some of the drivers of e-learning. Things like intranets and intranets, uh, virtual worlds and social networking, globalization, the need to train people in different locations and time zones, and just to name a few. There's a lot of different reasons that, that there's so much pressure to move into e-training or, or the uh, e-learning environment. Distance learning is a specific type of e-learning uh, that refers to a formal education that takes place off campus, usually but not always through online resources. So this is a great example of this course that we're taking right now, CIS 579, an example of distance learning. Uh, many times this the, the distance learning process is conducted through a, 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 a virtual university, an online university from which students take classes from home or other off-site locations, usually via the internet. Um, I would stress to you as students to check into the programs before you jump into these types of, of environments. It's not to say that you can't get a valuable education from, from these various universities. Uh, there are some very well-known universities that are out there. You know, the book talks about MIT having a program, for example, Stanford having a program. Um, probably the best known example is the University of Phoenix. Uh, but these are not all created equally. So, uh, when I, what I mean by that is there are accreditation standards that, that uh, some programs are accredited, some are not. Um, and when you check the accreditation, check that the, the value of that specific accreditation. In other words, not all accreditation bodies are the same either. So you want to make sure that your school that you're attending's programs are accredited um, for or by the companies that you're interested in, in pursuing. Uh, many times the, the government wants certain positions filled by um, students that have come from accredited institutions and in many cases regional accreditations don't count. Um, that's where the University of Phoenix really runs into a problem. A lot of their graduates' degrees don't count uh, in the eyes of, of the government. So watch out for that. Um, there's a lot of innovations in e-learning. In other words, we can, we're really only limited by our imagination as to, to uh, find different ways of, of being innovative 
uh, using e-learning technologies. The book spends a, a better part of a page on page it, 211 talking about learning via robots and the idea is putting a robot in a classroom and putting a face on it, put a monitor on it, uh, a camera on it to be able to interact with students and it can provide a variety of different uh, uh, functions. It can help students learn. Um, it, it book discusses how it, it, it at this point is very supplemental in the sense that it helps a teacher to teach the class, um, but other applications would include might include allowing a student who s stays at home sick to be able to attend class through the robot, uh, using the robot as a as a physical avatar present in the classroom. So there's a lot of, of uh, different innovations that are occurring in e-learning. E-learning also occurs in the corporate uh, uh, domain as well, and usually we'll refer to that as e-training. And certainly it gives us a, a, a few benefits to be able to do e-training in an online environment. Uh, for example, we can set up synchronous and asynchronous training sessions. In other words, we can have on-demand training for uh, users when they have a specific need that comes up. They can review a video or a little training session and, and learn how to accomplish that specific task. Or we can do synchronous training where we might uh, have a video conference together uh, with a variety of people from all over the world rather than having to fly them in together, spend all the money on, on, on uh, travel and, and uh, uh, accommodations and things of that nature. Uh, the book talks about several examples of, uh, of corporate training. Uh, they talk about cable and wireless in the UK. They talk about um, using e-learning um, to allow cable and wireless to rapidly deploy and reuse the training. They talk about the University of Toyota. So there's a number of different examples of, of different corporate training. In fact, many of you are professionals, and I'm sure you've gone through it in some way, shape, or form, some for, form of, of, of e-training uh, for the companies that you work for. Uh, the next section of the book talks about social networks and e-learning, or social learning. It's, this is learning, training, and knowledge sharing in, a so, in social networks uh, and by using s social software tools for learning. Um, it, it's really... Uh, something that uh, allows you to use some of the tools that are out there, some of the social tools that are out there, such as Facebook, MySpace, LinkedIn, and a whole host of other ones, to be able to get together and study or hold discussions online together. Um, Google Plus uh, it gets used for things like that as well. And then there's several different sites that allow you to, to they really kind of specialize in these types of things like LearnHub.com, StudyCurve.com, etc. Learning in virtual worlds such as Second Life offers a lot of opportunity for both educators as well as learners. Uh, users can participate in simulations, role playing, construction project, projects, as well as social events. Uh, they can explore things that, they, that wouldn't be possible in the physical world, things like uh, various fantasy worlds or gothic castles or explore ancient civilizations. So it provides an awful lot of opportunity to immerse learners in environments that they otherwise couldn't get to, uh, while at the same time reducing any effects that uh, students being spread across geography might might uh, place on the learning, uh, or or costs that are associated with trying to bring together students that are are, are dis, uh, dispersed across the the country or across the world. So it provides a lot of unique collabor uh, collaborative opportunities. Regarding ver uh, uh, visual interactive simulation, uh, some, some learners respond better to graphical displays, especially when they're done interactively. Um, so there's a lot of, of potential benefits when it comes to video uh, visual interactive simulation, such as shorter learning time, aiding the teacher, uh, to aid the teacher in how to operate complex equipment, aid in the teaching of how to, to operate complex equipment, enables self-paced learning uh, any, any place and any time, aids in memorization, it lowers the overall cost uh, of training, and it allows you to record an individual's learning progress and improve on it. So there's a lot of advantages to learning uh, in, uh, with, with this approach. As far as learning on demand, this is really kind of a new trend um, that allows you to basically kind of this just-in-time learning concept. Uh, it's provided to an employee while, while the work is being done in terms of troubleshooting and performance. 
and basically says that as you're completing a task, as you're working on a task, any training that you need occur, um, occurs while you are, you are conducting your work. In other words, when you need help, you get help. Uh, provided by various help files, video uh, files, uh, audio files, etc. Learning management systems, or LMSs, um, are basically software applications for administration, documentation, tracking, and reporting of training programs, classroom and online events, e-learning programs, and training content. Obviously the best example in our class is Blackboard, but there's other examples out there. For example, Moodle, uh, is an open source version of an LMS. There's WebCT, which I believe Blackboard's actually purchased, um, as well as several other examples that are out there. Some of the advantages that an LMS gives you is that it allows you to centralize and, and automate some of the administration tasks uh, that occur in a classroom. It allows you to use self-service and self-guided services. It allows you to assemble and deliver learning content rapidly. It allows you to consolidate training initiatives on a scalable web platform. In other words, you, you can have a few students, you can have a lot of students. Uh, LMSs are, are usually capable of scaling, scaling quite well. It uh, allows you to support portability and standards. and allows you to personalize content and, and enable knowledge reuse. As far as implementing e-learning and e-training uh, um, environments, some representative e-learning tools include, th include things like Macromedia, eCollege, Camtasia, and these are basically tools that allow you to create and generate content uh, to provide to your various users, your students, your the, your employees if you're talking about a uh, uh, e-learning in a corporate environment. There's a lot of different tools that are out there. You're really only limited in, in most cases by your creativity, how, you know, how much effort you want to put into it. Ebooks are another thing that are used in uh, electronic learning or electronic training. Uh, electronic book is a di is a book in digital form that can be read on a computer screen or on a special devices or on a special device. Um, there's a variety of different ways of reading these the, uh, an ebook via web access, so we're logging into a computer and using a web browser, uh, via web download where you might download a PDF or uh, uh, something of that nature, via a dedicated reader. Uh, so, such as Amazon's Kindle or something like that, a general purpose reader such as a uh, Palm Pilot, or via a web server. So there's a variety of different ways to, to go about reading ebooks. Uh, personally, I've got a, a little uh, Google um, Nexus 7 uh, that I can use for those types of things. My son has a Nook, uh, and, and they work fairly well. Uh, personally, I'm I'm uh, I still like the the hard books, uh, hardbacks, and uh, I don't even really like the soft cover uh, books. Um, I, I like the physical book to be able to look and, and dog ear the pages and underline things and things like that. But ebooks hold an awful lot of promise and, and for students that will actually utilize um, um, them and read them, it, it serves as a great alternative. Some of the advantages and limitations of ebooks. On the advantages side of things, it gives you the ability to store hundreds of books on a, a small portable device. Um, in the long run that, that lowers the cost because you can put uh, in one device you can uh, put a lot of books and ebooks usually cost significantly less. Uh, usually you can search the text uh, so you can find certain keywords that you, you might be interested in more quickly with an ebook. Usually you can get instant delivery. In other words, you can download load the book uh, almost instantly once you make the purchase rather than having to wait for it to be shipped. Portability is obviously a big issue. Uh, their their ebook readers are usually nice and small, or you, if they're online, you can, can access them from a variety of different sites. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, um, um, advantages to, uh, to ebooks. Um, they're easy to integrate content. They they tend to be durable. You can usually increase the font size. So if you're, you're like me, you're getting a little bit older, and uh, your eyesight might be fading a little bit. Usually, you have the ability to enlarge the font. Kind of hard to do with a traditional textbook. The media is quite rich. Ease of reproduction and distribution. Minimal cost over printing uh, out hard copies. Easy updating and reprinting. Almost no wear and tear. Easy to find out of. Print books. 
Um, and that's really pretty much it for that section. Section 5.3 talks about knowledge management and talks about advisory systems and e-commerce. Knowledge management is the process of capturing or creating knowledge, storing it, updating it constantly, and disseminating it, and using it whenever necessary. Organizations a lot of times try to capture knowledge uh, of their workers because they realize that the what really makes up their organization, the successful um, aspects of their organization, is usually people. And it's innovative people, people who are creating ideas and, and uh, um, hardworking um, that do the bulk of the work. And what they don't want to do is they don't want to lose those employees to other companies and, and have those employees take with them everything that they know. So if they can capture as much of their knowledge as they can, um, it, it behooves them to do so and share that with their uh, remaining employees as well as future employees. Knowledge management types and activities. Obviously, there's the, the need to create knowledge. Uh, once it's created, there's the need to, to capture it. There's the need to refine it in order to, to save the knowledge that is of value and to discard the knowledge that is not of value. Uh, it needs to be, you need to be able to store it. You need to be able to manage it. In other words, being able to find it when you need it. And then being able to dis uh, disseminate that knowledge. Be able to share it with the people that need the knowledge when they need it. Exhibit 5.5 exhibits this uh, uh, knowledge management system cycle, if you will, of creating, capturing, refining, storing, managing, disseminating, and then assessing and evaluating again as the cycle goes through uh, over and over again. Once we have captured knowledge and we've cleaned it up and, and stored it, we need to figure out some way of disseminating that knowledge to, to users, and that's where knowledge sharing comes in. And there's a variety of different software tools that, that enable us to share uh, share knowledge. There's collaborative commerce tools, there's expert and expertise location systems, there's dedicated systems designed for, for managing and sharing knowledge. Let's also not forget social networks, social networks and Web 2.0 tools. So there's a, a lot of different ways uh, of sharing knowledge once we've captured it and cleaned it up and stored it. How is knowledge management related to e-commerce? Well, e-commerce uh, uh, planning needs require a considerable amount of, uh, of knowledge, things like marketing plans, uh, marketing data. It gives us a lot of information about customers and their needs and gives us a lot of useful knowledge for planning and decision making. As far as knowledge management and, and social networks, a uh, major place of knowledge creation is in online communities. There's a lot of, of of knowledge to be gleaned from these these different um, groups in terms of crowdsourcing or wisdom of the crowd and, and communities of practice um, that these groups these di the dynamics of these groups generate an awful lot of of information and, and, and knowledge knowledge creation is the creation of knowledge for a specific problem or area individuals are asked to contribute to a solution or offer valuable advice for example IBM GE and other companies have communities of employees and business partners who contribute to, to idea generation or problem solving. So it's, it, it's similar to the social, social shopping that we had seen before where you might have social groups that come together to discuss, discuss the pros and cons about a particular book or a particular movie or something of that nature in order to drive sales. But you can do the same thing in a knowledge management uh, network uh, using social networks to be able to create knowledge, to, to work on a problem uh, together collaboratively. You've also got knowledge sharing, where members share knowledge by telling other members where to find knowledge of interest to the community. Um, for example, um, uh, EDI has a, a EDI fellowship program in which that's precisely what they do, is they have a network or directory of fellows that when they receive emails, they're they are uh, requests they are forwarded to the appropriate people, the, the subject matter experts in those particular areas. As far as deploying knowledge management technologies, it's not an easy process. They tend to be very expensive, um, it, so it's hard to calculate things like return on investment, um, defining the, the strategy, why are you capturing the data in the first place? That's not always easy to answer. Employees don't like new things, so there tends to be resistance from employees. 
So this process of implementing knowledge management systems isn't, a, isn't an easy process. Now on the back end of knowledge management systems you have databases that are really being used to store the information of the knowledge base. In that sense the knowledge base is almost like middleware um, serving as kind of a way to organize some of that data. And on the front end, the end that's touching the consumer, that's touching the user, you've got various expert or advice systems, consulting systems. And they can be used for a variety of different things. Medical advice, management consulting, legal advice, gurus, financial advice, social networks, other advisory services. So for example, take medical advice, for example. Um, websites like WebMD. They go out and they, they um, query various experts on, on, a, on various topics. They capture that, that knowledge into their, their system, into their databases, and they're able to provide advice back to consumers. Uh, same thing with legal advice. There are certain websites that do very similar things, financial advice, etc. Automated question and answer systems, or, or QAs, are systems that locate, extract, and provide specific answers to user questions expressed in natural language. The idea is that the, the uh, allowing users to express their questions in a natural language um, uh, allows them to ask their questions in a way that they understand, and yet the systems are able to ferret out the meaning of what the questions actually mean. This really kind of necessarily limits the domain of these types of questions. In other words, they don't answer, they don't res, uh, respond to a broad range of questions. They're usually relatively limited in scope, but they do facilitate the uh, um, user interaction because they do take questions in, in a more of a natural language. This is kind of related to live chat with experts. The difference being there's no experts on the back end. It's all computer generated. Live chat, with act, live chat with experts is basically using knowledge management systems to link together um, users uh, and, and suppliers of answers, if you will, um, with expert uh, opinion and expert answers. Uh, the book gives some examples of um, um, moon, uh, moon Toast, for example. Uh, they give uh, an example of a kind of... Uh, um, an example with respect to answers.com and ask.com we're able to type in a question and then have experts respond back to you. I've seen some of these sites used for, to answer for example automotive questions when people have problems with a the car they're able to type in the year make and model of the car and then describe the problem and they'll get mechanics, certified mechanics to respond to those answers uh, and, and so it's a way to use e-commerce technologies to be able to, to um, conduct those transactions of, uh, of exchanging information. If we move the uh, live chat with experts more towards a um, asynchronous communication model, we run across expert location systems, an interactive computerized system that helps employees find and connect with colleagues who have expertise required for specific problems. Um, expert location systems are really designed to identify people with expertise and link them to those with, the, with questions or problems, to identify potential staff for projects requiring specific expertise, to link people to information about experts, to assist in career development, and to provide support for teams and communities of practice. So it's, it's kind of the example that I was giving before when I was talking about EDI. It, it, it allows you to ask a question and get, a, get an expert to actually respond to it.
the process works essentially by having an employee submit a question to the the uh, expert location system the software is going to search its database to see if an answer for that question already exists and if so he'll go ahead and supply that answer if not it's going to submit the question to a qualified expert uh, is it by finding that expert and asking them if they're willing to respond to that specific uh, uh, query. Once they respond to it, it's going to be reviewed for accuracy by the by the organization, and the response is going to be sent uh, back to the person who made the query. At the same time, the question and the response are going to be added to the knowledge base so that in the future, when this question is asked again, instead of being referred to the expert, the knowledge base can automatically respond to that answer. Collaborative commerce is the use of digital technologies to enable companies to collaboratively plan, design, develop, manage, and research products, services, and innovative e-commerce applications. Some of the tools that are, are used to do this include things like groupware, blogs, wikis, and other spe uh, specially designed e-commerce collabor collaboration tools. Some of the major benefits of, of doing this include things like cost reduction, increased revenue, faster move of goods, and better customer retention. And all this collaborative commerce has to occur in some place, and that's what a collabor collaboration hub is. It's a central point of control uh, for an e-market. A single C-hub representing one e-market owner can host multiple collaboration spaces. In other words, multiple tools, multiple groupwares or blogs, wikis, etc in order to be able to exchange this information and, and so that all the partners uh, may benefit from that. Exhibit 5, 7, Elements and Process of e of C commerce Systems kind of illustrates this entire process. If you look at the, at the top left, you really kind of see a lot of the things that need to be shared. The ERP systems, Supply Chain Management, Knowledge Management Systems, CAD drawings and blueprints, uh, and bill, bills of materials, products and process surfing uh, uh, um, uh, logs, etc. So that really kind of serves as our data repository. We need to be able to extract that information and uh, analyze that information in business intelligence and decision support systems, uh, workflow uh, intelligence systems, etc. Uh, and then graphically demonstrate that or illustrate that to to the various users, to the various people that need to be able to evaluate that information. In the bottom left, it kind of illustrates the process uh, uh, of this in terms of product service design, collaboration, demand visibility and, and forecasting, supply chain visibility and planning, and strategy decision making. So one of the senses that you should be getting um, out of all this talk about commerce, e-commerce, uh, c-commerce, um, uh, and, and the systems that are based off of them is that there's a lot of coordination, a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of cooperation between different players that are using these systems um, both above and below the organization whether it be a consumer, uh, a supplier, a retailer, a manufacturer these different links in the supply chain have to be able to cooperate and a lot of this uh, leads us to things like uh, uh, some of the processes, some of the techniques that, that are used, such as vendor managed inventory, a system in which retailers make their supplies fully respons suppliers fully responsible for determining when to order and possibly how much to order. So for example, in the book they talk about Target and the, the idea is, is that they might have a supplier that stocks their shelves uh, with um, paper towels and they have to open up their systems at least based on uh, uh, so that their supplier can see how many paper towels are still on the shelves in other words how fast they're selling what time of the day they're selling what days of the week they're selling um, and that they work collaboratively together to be able to project those sales and make decisions about when's the best time to restock the shelves this is a win-win situation this allows uh, target to, to focus more on what they do, providing customer service and, and actually uh, selling the products um, and, and getting com customers to come in the doors, getting them to pick things off the shelves and getting them, them uh, out the doors paying their bills without having to stock the shelves all the time, without having to place orders and walking around and managing their inventory. 
uh, for the supplier, for the, the vendor that's selling, uh, in, in this case, paper towels, um, it allows them to be more proactive uh, in, in dealing with Target and making sure that those shelves are stocked exactly the way that they want in the quantities that they want. Uh, and so it really becomes a win-win situation. But these two uh, organizations have to work very tightly and very in a very integrated way and in a way that they trust each other to be able to open their systems up in order to be able to, to have some visibility into what's going on on the, the supply and, and demand side of things. Exhibit 5.8 gives you an example of Target's extranet. Uh, essentially what they're doing is they're opening up their internal system to some of their suppliers. It talks about some of the concerns that they might have in terms of security. They, they need to be concerned with access control. In other words, they don't want to just allow anybody access to their, their, uh, their network, so they have to be careful about access control. They have to provide for registration, authentication, digital signatures, etc. It has a role for various web applications, for connection, uh, uh, different points of entry, uh, as well as linkages to, to legacy systems. So there's a variety of different considerations that not only Target, but the various other um, um, organizations that they're dealing with have to be cognizant of. Collaborative commerce has an awful lot of upside to it, including the ability to reduce transportation and inventory costs, reduce the design cycle time, reduce the product development time, and eliminate channel conflict collaboration with dealers and retailers. As far as implementing um, uh, C-commerce, there's a number of examples out there. Some of them are, are more current than others, but there, there's Dell, Cisco, and HP, for example. And all these, uh, at one point or another, have, have used collaborative commerce strategically to enable sophisticated business models, while at the same time being able to transform their value chains and, and be able to provide value to, to consumers in ways that other organizations have found difficult to, to, uh, to duplicate. As far as barriers to, um, to C-commerce, there's all, all those benefits, but it really hasn't caught on as fast as, as you might think, given all those, those, those benefits. Uh, some of the reasons are technical. Uh, for example, lack of internal integration, standards and networks, security and privacy concerns, distrust over who has access to, to important information stored in, 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 in databases, lack of defined and universally agreed upon standards. XML actually holds some promise there and, and has the potential to, to kind of pull us uh, away from that particular uh, barrier. Uh, there's also less technical or, or non-technical issues that, that are problematic as well. Language incompatibility, cultural misunderstandings, for example. To overcome some of these barriers, uh, specialized e-commerce software tools may be able to break down some of the, the barriers to, to C-commerce. Uh, additionally, as customers, or excuse me, as companies, learn more about the major benefits of, uh, of C-commerce, uh, such as smoothing supply, the supply chain, reducing inventories and, and operating costs, etc. Uh, hopefully companies will start to buy into this a little bit more and be able to overcome some of those barriers. Consumer to consumer or C to C e-commerce is an e-commerce model in which consumers sell directly to other consumers. Some textbooks don't treat this as a separate uh, subcategory of e-commerce, if you will. Uh, essentially the idea is that because you have one selling to another that the one selling is acting as a business and they consider it part of the B2C market. Um, but there's several different examples and probably the best one is in, in the auction in, environment, the C2C auctions. eBay is a great example. You have consumers that sell to other consumers. You have classified ads, personalized ads with uh, um, uh, some of the various examples that you have there. Fire, file sharing utilities such as Napster, which is sort of still around, and, and some of those other ones, as well as C2C activities and social networks and trading virtual properties. Um, so there's a, a lot of different examples out there where there are exchanges going on from consumer to consumer, uh, and some people view that as a separate category of, of e-commerce. So what are some of the managerial uh, issues of, of some of the topics that we talked about in, in uh, this lecture? 
Well, there's obviously there's a lot of opportunity for uh, e-government to improve the offerings that they have and, and become more efficient. Um, I, I hope that you kind of take away that um, they want to move in that direction, even though they may not be moving as fast as, as some consumers would like, but uh, that is a, certainly a goal. Um, how do we design the most cost-efficient government you know, e-procurement systems? Well, that, that's, that's definitely an, an issue that we've, we've got to figure out. That's part of that process. How do we design the portfolio of e-learning knowledge sources? How do we incorporate social networking-based learning and, and services in, in our organizations? There's a lot of different social uh, uh, networks, uh, networking tools that are out there, and we can use them in a variety of different ways. So, what is the best mix of those using those social networking tools to be able to enhance learning uh, and services within our organization? Those are, are some of the challenges that the leaders in our organizations may, may have. What will the impact be of the ebook platform? Uh, I think it's been pretty substantial already. The sales a few years ago, a couple of years ago, um, maybe not even quite that long ago, uh, passed uh, ebook sales passed. Uh, sales of traditional paper books um, and and so certainly the impact is, is huge uh, I think over time it, it will it will continue to move in that direction and will, to the point that that paper books really are a thing of the past still another managerial issue is how do we connect our expert location systems and social networking initiatives we talked about the value of, of these in terms of being able to uh, create knowledge, capture knowledge, disseminate knowledge, um, and, and we need to be able to figure out ways of doing this as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, another managerial issue is how difficult is it to introduce e-collaboration? In other words, there's a, oftentimes pushback from users. Uh, how are we going to get them to use our systems? Can we capitalize on C2C e-commerce? How do we go about doing that? Certainly eBay's managed to do that uh, by charging a percentage of each sale to facilitate this type, these types of transactions. Um, but are there other ways to, to capitalize on those markets? How much can be shared with business partners? That was a concern. one of the concerns that we talked about, that in order to be able to have vendor-managed inventory, we have to open up our systems uh, even if only a, to a small degree to various business partners but the moment we do that we set ourselves up to uh, potential misconfiguration or uh, an invasion of privacy it, things like that that really create a, a, a trust issue that we have to monitor very carefully uh, who benefits from vendor managed inventory in the best of situations, everybody does. The consumer does because of reduced prices. The the uh, supplier does. The retailer does. Everybody should benefit if if everything's work out. If, if everything works out the way it should, is that always the case? No. But managing those relationships becomes much more important in order to be able to make sure that everything does work out the way it should. So, in summary, this chapter talked about e-government activities. We talked about implementing e-government to citizens, businesses, and its own operations. We talked about e-learning and e-training and e-books and, and some of the different types of readers. We talked about knowledge management and disseminating knowledge as an e-business. We talked about online advisory systems like WebMD. We talked about collaborative commerce and collaboration 2.0. And then the chapter finished up with C2C or consumer to consumer activities. This concludes Chapter 5, Innovative E-Commerce Systems from E-Government to E-Learning, Collaborative Commerce and C2C Commerce.